Well, I'm very excited to have these many questions here. We had so many questions from the lecture on Sherlock Holmes that we weren't really able to fit them all into the time we had set aside. So now I am answering those questions in an extra recording here. So I'm so excited about the response and all the people who tuned in and thank you for the many emails you've sent. I appreciate those very, very much. So I'll go ahead and go through these questions and answer them the best I can. Thank you so much for them. First of all, someone asks, is that a Persian slipper on the mantle? And that's this thing here on the mantle. Let me see if I can shift the right way. So the question is, is that uh, a Persian slipper? And the answer is yes. Sherlock Holmes often stored tobacco in the toe of a Persian slipper. And that was supposed to be something that preserved it. You'll see other items in the room here that are Sherlock Holmes's. He was very much known for playing the violin. I think I mentioned that in that list. Uh, number two, uh, interesting question. As a biological physical anthropologist who has a doctorate in that field and a writer of old time radio drama, and let me just stop you there and say, I would love to meet you. I love old time radio drama and I would love to see what you're doing. So please feel free to send me an email, uh, which is C-H-A-G-O-O-D at F-A-U dot E-D-U. I'd love to hear about that and get to know you better. Anyway, as a biological physical anthropologist and writer of old time radio drama, I always point out the difference between induction and deduction of the scientific method. Often the use of de deduction by Doyle and Holmes is what we would call induction today, observation and facts and generation of a hypothesis or theory versus deduction expected observation from testing a theory. In the history of science, I'm curious if the terms were used interchangeably, interchangeably at the time, mid to late 19th century, do you have any information on this observation? You know, this is something that's bothered me for a while too, because deduction, you know, comes from that Aristotelian background of a syllogism with these, with a major premise and minor premise and a conclusion. Induction has a, a very different kind of movement to it. And yes, much more, that seems like a more appropriate term for what Holmes does. I don't know that the terms were used interchangeably. Uh, my guess is not. I, I'm not sure about that, but I, I don't think so. I think this may be more of an idiosyncratic uh, use of this term by Doyle. It may be also that, uh, and part of this is implied in the question that maybe at that time, maybe these terms were not quite as uh, solidified maybe as we think of them being today. And, but it may not be so much that they were interchangeable. It just may be that Doyle, as he was, uh, Doyle, according to his training, thought that deduction was the term to use. And so it may have been uh, not necessarily interchangeable, but maybe uh, particular to the particular training he was involved in, it may not have been quite as systematized. Or maybe that's, he just got it wrong, who knows? Although I will say that Doyle tended to be, believe in precision. So probably whatever he was doing, I mean, it, he used it pretty consistently. All right, next question, uh, somebody says, um, by the way, I don't know who's written these. So, um, but anyway, I wanna thank you all for them one more time. Anyway, wondering about how Holmes has sent modern CSI down a wrong path or what we, know now what Doyle, that Doyle did not know in the 1890s about criminal investigation. Is there a parallel with Freud and psychoanalysis? The founder, uh, meaning Freud has been much maligned, um, but you know, he got the ball rolling is kind of the question here. Okay, so uh, something interesting, even though Doyle did have some involvement in real life criminal investigation, Typically, mystery writers do not necessarily great real life investigators make. So um, I don't know that that Doyle's writing necessarily had much impact on the history of crime scene, scene investigation. Um, my sense is that probably it did not. It obviously had a big influence on fiction. But I don't know that it really had much impact there. I think that developed in its its own way. Uh, that's my understanding. I'm, uh, there may be criminologists in this audience who could provide more information, but my guess is that, um, my sense is in fact that it, it didn't really have much impact. 
that way. I think people enjoy the writing, but even in the fiction, you get a lot of uh, writing, certainly by the 1920s and 30s, uh, kind of hard boiled fiction that you get by the likes of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett, people like that. You know, that they very clearly want you to know they're not Sherlock Holmes and that the consulting detective model does not necessarily work and that you're probably going to have to crack a jaw or two, uh, really. Okay, uh, do you know the Ronald uh, Howard Holmes series? You know, I have just a very passing familiarity with it. I know that uh, Ronald Howard, or at least my understanding has always been that he was the son of Leslie Howard, whom I know as being the actor who portrayed uh, Scarlet Pimpernel and Ashley Wilkes and Gone with the Wind. And I, so I believe Ronald was his son. And I know that uh, he, if I'm thinking about the right person, there was a series of Holmes screen, there was a home screen presence by him. I'm not as familiar with it though. Number five, what of other Holmes characters, Holmes like characters, other genres have I mentioned Spock? Well, you know, I mentioned uh, the uh, Sheldon from the, uh, Sheldon Cooper, I believe his last name is, from the Big Bang theories. He's very Sherlockian. Uh, Spock is too, absolutely. That focus on logic, dispassionate, able to cut through uh, any kind of subterfuge or any kind of noise in order to get at a logical conclusion. Uh, yeah, there are so many. Again, we mentioned House and, and others. So there's Anytime you see a character who is is like that, you're going to see who's, who has that approach, uh, not much swayed by emotion, able to solve cases with logic and so forth. It's a Holmes character. Uh, one of these, by the way, is, is a kid's uh, character uh, from kids' books. I know when I was a kid, I don't know if this character is still around, but uh, Encyclopedia Brown would be another example. Um, did Doyle ever consider a crossover with Professor Challenger? I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, what was the influence of Eugene Vidocq's accomplishments on Doyle's homes? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I don't know that there's a very direct influence here. I know that Vidocq, uh, the, his precedent, uh, had influence on a number of writers. I don't know, I'm not aware of Doyle mentioning any direct connection. It may be there, but I'm not aware of it. Uh, what is my favorite Holmes story? What is my favorite Sherlock Holmes story and why? Oh, that's a hard, <clears throat> hard one to answer. Someone may have asked me that before. I, I don't know. Oh no, someone asked who is my favorite on screen. Now, what's my favorite story? Oh, it's hard to answer. It's, it's, um, <laughs> it really depends on the day. I love the atmosphere of the speckled band. Always loved that story. Um, I actually really like the Redheaded League. It's one of my very favorites. Um, I guess for me, I, you know, I like the sound, the sign of four a lot, it's a longer piece. But I guess the Hound of the Baskervilles, it's just hard to beat its atmosphere. And it's funny because, you know, we read for a lot of different reasons. And when I, you know, I love to read how the, the plot will play out and how the sleuth will solve the case, whether it's Agatha Christie or, or anyone else, G.K. Chesterton, or doesn't matter who it is, but I, I really like the atmosphere. So if I'm reading, you know, some kind of Florida noir book by John D. McDonald or Brett Halliday, I, I like the atmosphere. And for me, the atmosphere of uh, the uh, Hound of the Baskervilles is, is the best one, I think. Um, okay, in which order do you personally recommend we should read the canon? That's an interesting question. I would say this. I will, I will confess something. I, I'm not actually a big fan of A Study in Scarlet. I like the beginning, but all the stuff that goes out into Utah, and I, I don't know, it just kind of loses me. Um, but I would say probably you should start with the beginning, probably with A Study in Scarlet, because it introduces Holmes, and it helps people to see who he is. You see the character develop and you get to know the character uh, just as Watson does. So I would say study in Scarlet, uh, then uh, The Sign of Four, which comes next, and then The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the collection of that the story is the first collection. Um, and then 
uh, memoirs of Sherlock Holmes and then a return of Sherlock Holmes. I, I would say really probably following them in order is probably the best move. That was not how I did it when I was a kid at all. I, I grew up, my father was, when I was growing up, uh, watched, uh, he had always had on television the uh, Basil Rathbone series of films and I got interested in the radio ones uh, when I was in high school but I didn't and I just sort of read the stories as they came I remember there was a, an edition uh, that was published in connection with that Jeremy Brett BBC series and I just sort of read the stories as I came to them and they were not always in order but I, I would think I think following them in order has a lot of advantages uh and let's see um thank you so much by the way people have had such nice things to say about the lecture i've read that arthur conan doyle actually ran into angry fans that surrounded him on occasions after he killed off homes where the bobbies had to break up the crowds have you seen anything like that as far as i know those stories are apocryphal i don't think they're actually true but they're great stories and maybe they are true uh there are a lot of things that happen in people's lives that may not always get recorded i'm not familiar with one of those things happening, but I can see it happen. Um, what do you think modern super sleuth stories, such as CSI, Murdoch Mysteries, Prime Suspect, et cetera, get right and wrong in the genre? Oh, that's a big question. Um, I really, I'm sorry to disappoint whoever is asking this question, but I, I would not consider myself well-versed enough in those particular shows. There are so many to speak about that or speak to that with any nuance. The only thing I will say, and I'm not sure if you mean actual, kind of like the earlier question, if you mean actual investigation or right and wrong in the sense of the genre. Um, but I would say that probably the thing I like the most about this kind of writing is that it has such a breadth of approaches. So whether you're reading James Lee Burke or Brett Halliday or, um, you know, any number, Agatha Christie, any number of writers who do this kind of thing, or in this case, television shows, it's the fact that they do take a, a little bit different approach or they bring a certain area into play in a certain way. I really like that. So I guess I think that's what they, they get uh, right. Okay, next, uh, today we have a number of buddy detectives, Vienna Blood, Miss Scarlet, Father Brown, uh, Miss Fisher, where her buddy is the actual police officer. Absolutely, it's true. I do wanna say one little thing about um, Father Brown. These were stories by, originally by G.K. Chesterton. So they were kind of on the heels of, and kind of in some ways very uh, parallel to Sherlock Holmes, but <laughs> Sherlock Holmes is, you know, um, it, 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 Father Brown is a very different kind of a character uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, he is even more, in a way, he's less retiring than Sherlock Holmes, but he's not quite as dynamic, I think, in certain ways, in terms of his personality. Uh, that's not a slam, it's just a different approach. So you have Colombo and you have Father Brown and uh, you have the Earl Dave Biggers, Created a character, an Asian sleuth named Charlie Chan, who uh, there were a number of novels written about him, by written concerning him by Earl Dare Biggers, and there was uh, there were films made as well. Um, but yes, absolutely, um, to the point about buddy detective stories. How does Mycroft expand Holmes' case? Holmes's cases. Mycroft shows up at at interesting times, and sometimes he brings cases to Holmes. Mycroft. I will say this about Holmes. He has an air of superiority, and Mycroft has even an even greater air of superiority about him. So a lot of times when Mycroft shows up on the scene, he's he's sort of looking, I don't want to say looking down at Holmes, his brother, but uh, he has a kind of a, a, there's a playfulness about Mycroft. And he says, well, you can solve this little case. Mycroft is very highly positioned, by the way, you know, we're talking about Holmes being maybe not so politically minded or aware. Mycroft is very much so. He is very politically connected, very concerned with world and national affairs. So it's really, you know, when there's an expansion in terms of this, the stakes being higher, often Mycroft is there for that. 
why do you, why do pers what do I personally, I guess the question is, think Sherlock Holmes is so popular even after all these years, 130 years? Well, that's quite a question. What is it about Holmes that makes him still live? Why is he still so popular? Uh, especially because sometimes Holmes can be kind of a jerk, you know? Um, you know, that's a really fascinating question. And I think, you know, Holmes, uh, because he is an archetype in certain ways, and he represents a kind of archetype, he is, because he's a kind of superhero, um, he doesn't lose much uh, at all. He, he all, almost always has the answers. And I think that Holmes, I think part of the reason that Holmes, people like Holmes, is partly his antics. But I think there may be also something a little deeper, which is the idea that here's someone who, because this person is not swayed by anything other than logic and reason, you can depend on this person to get at the truth and to find justice. When all else has failed, when you're not sure about the, you know, Scotland Yard or, you know, the police force or something, that they're going to get it right, or maybe if you're worried about corruption of some kind. You don't have to worry about that with Sherlock Holmes. That's that's the the good side of Holmes. It's the thing that makes Spock uh, interesting. Uh, it's it's the kind of thing that um, there's something kind of invincible about these characters. Uh, and really, Holmes is kind of yeah, he's the underlying archetype. And I think I think as long as we believe there's a Sherlock Holmes in the world, we believe there's a stopgap. There's 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 someone there to keep us from. Uh, from, uh, from to keep justice from disappearing altogether. In reality, in life, uh, we might not have that feeling of perception or understanding because um, things do not always turn out in a way that we understand to be just. But with Holmes, they're there. So I, I think it's partly the antics of Sherlock Holmes, but I think it's also partly a, an issue having to do with justice. The idea that there's somebody out there who's who's we can depend on um, always to do the right thing when it comes to that. Um, very similar question, why this character uh, fits in every period of time and every century, I, I think because he's an archetype. Uh, do we know what Doyle thought of Poe? So very different personalities. Uh, that Poe as an influence is very clear. In fact, uh, Holmes says to Watson at one point, he says, you know, you're kind of doing what Poe did. You're talking about, you know, or somebody else mentioned something, I think, at one point in one of the stories. One of the early, in fact, I think a study in Scarlet, uh, where a character says, well, is Holmes, you know, compares Holmes to Dupin. So I think that Doyle is a big fan of Edgar Allan Poe's. Uh, yeah, their personalities, yes, maybe aren't the same, but I don't think he was too much worried about his personality. I think he was, I think that Doyle was more interested in Poe's writing. Uh, someone says, can you expand upon Holmes's personality? I think that's what this person means. Oh, wait a minute, I skipped one. Are there any cases Holmes lost? Yes, there are a handful of cases that will say Holmes did not quite get solved. Actually, that story, that breakout story, a, stu a, a study, I mean, um, not the first one, a study of Scarlet, but a scandal of Bohemia, that, that story that has been so popular with Irene Adler. Adler, Irene Adler gets the best of Holmes. Uh, it doesn't really kind of, he doesn't, in a way, he loses the case. But there are also cases that, yeah, he doesn't solve or whatever. So there aren't many. There are only like three or four or five, maybe. Uh, the most famous one is that that one, though, the uh, scandal in Bohemia. So my says expand Holmes' personality. I, I guess what you mean by that is to talk a little bit more about him. And I feel like I've done that in this um, in this time of answering these questions. But uh, Holmes is. I guess to add a few other, he's very quirky. He is, his energy is a certain way. He is known when he's really concentrating, he, he's known to sit in one of these chairs and, and close his eyes for hours, not eat a word, not eat anything, not say a word. Uh, he, I think, uh, I think someone asked about cocaine somewhere along the line, but anyway, uh, he uses uh, drugs, uh, cocaine and this kind of thing and uh he he uh, sometimes will play his violin he'll sometimes go to the opera 
to help him concentrate. He can be quite smug. Uh, and yet there's a part of him that for all of his anti-romance uh, and emotion, he can be very endearing. And he, in fact, cares for Watson very deeply and for Mrs. Hudson and probably for his brother, too. Um, he can be very funny. He has a, a sense of humor. It's, it's his own kind of sense of humor. But there's a lot. I, I would say uh, the best way to get to experience his home's personality is just to read the stories. You, you will get that loud and clear. Uh, here's a question. I thought I saw the word cocaine in here somewhere. Why was Sherlock created using cocaine? Did Doyle have an issue with drugs? I don't think that Doyle had any substance abuse uh, challenges in his life, but uh, but he does create homes, uh, again, uh, doing cocaine and all of this. And, you know, there's a really, I'll just say this about it. I know someone who wrote a book about uh, detect or Victorian writing. It had a great reading of Holmes uh, injecting the drugs into a system. And, and this person was arguing that, that this was symbolic of uh, elements from the empire, the periphery being injected into London into the center of the British Empire, which I thought was pretty interesting. I don't know that Doyle was thinking about that, but I thought it was an interesting take on this. But I think this was part of showing Holmes being edgy. Now, Watson takes him to task, by the way, for this drug use, I should tell you. But it's the idea is that Holmes is so intense, you know, and uh, he, he, he needs uh, constant stimulation and uh, he he uh, he's a certain kind of person that way. So anyway, that's it's part of his characterization. And I think this is the final question. Uh, there's a quite a few. There's twenty questions, literally twenty questions. <laughs> anyway, what do you think? What makes that character Sherlock Holmes so specific that the stories have been translated in so many languages? Um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. You know, he, Holmes. He's you see him as an international figure, what is it about, you know, it's so specific and yet he can be translated and what is it about that? And again, I think it's partly the, as I said earlier, the, the, his antics, but I really think that there's something even deeper that appeals to us, to many people about Holmes. And that is again, that feeling or that sense, that belief that as long as he's on the job, uh, that you can know that justice will be served. Well, those are all the questions. Thank you very much. I do appreciate the emails and I will get those answered directly. And please feel free to follow up uh, even from this. Thank you so much.